It is a great pleasure to introduce uh, Claudia Bocur. Uh, she got uh, her PhD in, uh, at the University of Milano. Thereafter, she moved uh, as a visiting postdoc for a one-year appointment to the University of Melbourne, Australia, and then uh, uh, back to Italy at the University uh, Cattolica del Sacro Cuore, uh, then uh, Instituto Nazionale di Alta Matematica, uh, an appointment at the University of Milano Bicocca, and finally landed at the University <laughs> of Insubria and RISM, and it is, it is a great pleasure for us to have you here. And so I give the word to Professor Bazzoni, who is the chairman for the scientific introduction. Please. Um, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome a new colleague to our uh, mathematical section at Insubria, Claudia Bukur. And today she will give a talk about symmetry in R2 of global minimizers of a general non local energy. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, good day, everybody. And for those in, uh, here with me, live and those uh, from home. It's uh, really a pleasure for me to be here. I have just started working at Insubria and RISM at the beginning of February, so this is all fresh and I'm really happy about it. So I w um, my intention is to give um, an introductory uh, seminar. So I will, let's say I will, oh, let me also thank, of course, Daniele Cassani for having uh, given me the possibility of having this talk, of course. So, as I was saying, I would like to um, touch a couple of very uh, introductive aspects um, and then move on to my main result, which is, of course, related to, to these, these uh, two aspects that I'm going to introduce. So, the first thing, I'm going to talk a little bit about non-local operators, which is the main argument of, uh, of my research. I'm going to introduce some of the operators that I have worked with, and I'm going to, going to talk a little bit about the most famous of them. Uh, possibly some of them already know it, it's the fractional Laplacian, and I'm going to use it, say, as a baseline for uh, the introduction for more general non-local operators. I'm going to talk a little bi a bit about a uh, conjecture of uh, Ennio de Giorgi, and the conjecture is about, uh, so there's a local conjecture, which is related to some solutions of the allen kahn equation, the stationary allen kahn equation, which is Laplace of u is equal to u minus u uh, to the third. And I'm going, so it's a very interesting conjecture. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the results are up to today. It's, uh, there, are, there are some aspects which are still open, so the, the conjecture is not completely uh, solved. And I'm going to talk a little bit about then the non-local uh, counterpart, so it's just uh, substituting the Laplace operator with, with uh, its fractional counterpart. And we're going to see a little bit about the differences and the similitudes with respect to the, to the local case. And <coughs> after having introduced this main uh, big two aspects, I'm going to arrive at my main result, which is, let's say, some generalization in, uh, in a sense of the... Um, of the result of, let's say, the, 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 uh, the, the Georgi conjecture, which is related to, a no, uh, to more general non-local operators, so more general than the fractional Laplacian. And the result is going to be given in, a, say, in a variational context. So it's going to be given in terms of minimizers of a non-local energy. And that's uh, the explanation of my title, which is symmetry uh, in, uh, in R2, so in the, in the plane of minimizers of a general type of non-local energy. Okay, <laughs> so non-local operators. The main, uh, the main argument of my research for, for these years have been a type of non-local operators, in particular those uh, which are fractional and of integral type. The most famous case, and I'm, I will just go straight up to, to the definition, is the fractional Laplacian, and this is one of the definition of the fractional Laplacian, which is given for, say, a good enough function, which is defined on the n-dimensional Euclidean space with values in R, and is given in, in this way. So you have the uh, 
delta to the power s, which is a fractional parameter of the function nu, evaluated the point x is given as the integral over the whole space Rn. And then you have two, uh, two times, so the double difference u of x minus u x plus y minus u x minus y. And everything is divided by this kernel, which is uh, y to the power n, dimension of the space, plus 2s, s give, uh, is the fractional parameter. So I will go just a little bit into the explanation just by uh, making clear what I mean by the underlying words. So this is the typical non-local operator given in this form. And it's now local because uh, with respect to its local counterpart, which is the Laplace operator, or any log, say, when you take the local derivative, what you do in order to have, to be able to compute the derivative, you have to have information about the function near to the point you are computing. In the non-local case, you actually need information about the function everywhere in this space or even far away from the point you're looking at. So we are computing in x, but y can travel all around in the whole space Rn. Of course, the, these interactions, far away interactions are weighted, and further away you are, uh, less, the interaction, less strong is the interaction. This is also very important, uh, this non-local non, non aspect is very important when one has to deal with basic uh, uh, problems involving non-local operators. So if one takes simply La fraction Laplace of u equal to zero in a domain, so you consider S harmonic functions, in order to be able to solve the problem, you don't, it is not enough to have boundary data. So you can, it is not enough to have, say, a function u given on the, on, uh, sorry, on the boundary of the set, but you have to have information all over the set. Uh, the complementary of the set you are, in which you, you set your problem. The fractional aspect is given by this uh, fractional parameter, S, that I'm going to fix in 0, 1. And generally what, it, what holds for the fractional Laplacian and for other opera operators like uh, this one is that there is a relation with the classical counterpart, which is very simple. If eventually renormalizing, sending S to 1, you get its local counterpart. This is generally, um, well, this is quite interesting also from another point of view, is that if you want to look at problems involving the fractional Laplacian and you have some properties of solutions and so on, then you expect for S close to one to obtain the same properties as you have in the classical case. And this is always a good, uh, say, a good thing we do, uh, things we discover for the fractional Laplacian, we confront them, at least for S that goes to one to the, to the classical Laplacian, and if you obtain the same, say, the same constant, the same properties, then you are assured that you are on the good, uh, on the, on the good uh, road. Okay, the last aspect is integral, and this is well, quite obvious from its definition. Let me just mention that you have the integration of this, of this difference. Here I just use the, the symmetry of the, of, the, of, the, of the space Rn. And you have this integration with respect to a, a kernel, which is singular at infinity and at zero. So you have to have some good conditions on u in order to have a, a good definition. For instance, u uh, bounded at infinity and say smooth enough around the point x is just enough to have this definition uh, uh, well-defined, say. Okay. The fractional Laplacian, as I said, is very famous and goes way beyond the, de the definition in the integral form that I have, that I have, uh, I have written on, the, on, the, uh, on my PDF. Uh, it is studied in various branches of mathematics in different forms. That is, there is actually this nice paper of this Polish guy, Kawinski, I, I can't say it very well, uh, which is called 10 equivalent definitions of the fractional Laplacian, which is quite famous. So it is used in statistics, it is well known, it is a generator of Levy processes. It is uh, also a pseudo-differential operator symbol to S, so we use it in, my, say, microanalysis. It's the inverse of the risk potential, so you have a lot, uh, the theory of potential related to the, also the, to the risk potential to the fractional Laplacian and so on. And it also, it has been studied a, a, a lot, uh, also for these various, uh, uh, other definitions in many real-life models, 
And I've, I'm not going to go into detail, but I found this, uh, this table in this paper, which is published in Journal of Computations Physics uh, last year. And I think it's quite nice to, understand, to just give a really big idea of how many applications uh, you can use the fractional Laplace in. So you have diffusion reaction, quasi-geostrophic, Can Hilliard, which is the one we are going to talk a little bit about, porous medium, Schrodinger equations, ultrasound, and so on. So there is really a vast variety of, uh, of, of physics, for instance, here of physical applications of the fractional Laplace. Okay, <laughs> so going a little bit back to my, my field of study, uh, what we do is that we study these operators, say, from uh, a PDE's perspective. So we are interested in existence of solutions, regularity, uh, properties of solutions, say a little bit of uh, theory of potential, and uh, so we look it, at it from one side, from this side. And from this side, we are interested in uh, more general operators, and these names that I'm going to say out are just, as for the fractional Laplacian, the fractional counterpart of their classical cases. So uh, we have uh, the fractional P Laplacian, and that includes some very recent uh, literature on the one Laplacian and the infinity fractional Laplacian. Then you have all the fractional, uh, say, counterpart of, no of minimal surfaces, which is the theory of Cacciopoli and De Giorgi, uh, where the basic thing you define the perimeter, uh, the, the mean curvature, which is the first variation of the perimeter, which involves the, uh, let's say, the mean curvature, of the, uh, the mean curvature operator. I'm not, going, I'm not going to go much into detail. So you also have, say, the fractional counterpart of, of all that theory. So these are other uh, more general operators that I have also worked with. So one of the questions <coughs> I've mentioned a little bit before that arises when studying these operators is to understand the differences and the similitude with respect to the classical case. And we are going, or there are some, say, some equations, some problems that have been solved for, say, the Laplace operator. What can we say about the fractional Laplace case? And I'm going to address this question by looking at uh, the, this uh, De Giorgi conjecture, first from <laughs> the local point of view and then from the non-local side. So the De Giorgi conjecture is uh, uh, related to this uh, allen kahn equation, the stationary version in which you have minus Laplace of u is equal to u minus u to the third, and the equation has to be satisfied in the whole space Rn. And the conjecture uh, formulated around 78 says that uh, a bounded solution, for instance, uh, bounded below and above by minus one plus one, monotone in one direction, is one dimensional for n smaller or equal than eight. What is one dimensional? <laughs> well, you can express the function which is defined. So u is defined, of course, over the whole space Rn. You can express it as a function of one spatial variable. So putting it in a, from, from a more geometric point of view, what you can say is that every level set of u is a hyperplane. So this is the, this is the conjecture. And I will try uh, next to um, show a little bit where the number eight comes from. And I'm going to do that by introducing the phase transition model from which the allen kahn equation is, uh, is drawn, or at least with which it is related. <coughs> so the conjecture is related to a phase transition model. I have drawn a very not so good picture here. And say you have a container which holds some substance and this substance can reach two pure phases that I have called plus one and minus one. And remember that I have said that the solution is bounded by plus one and minus one. So this is, let's say this is Y. And <coughs> what happens is that at equilibrium the two, uh, the two phases tend to separate and they form an interface of separation. What is, and I'm going to say this very roughly speaking, what happens is that the interface of separation is asymptotically a minimal surface. So it's a surface of, of, of a, mi a minimal area. And this, is, this explains the number eight. And we're going to arrive after giving the, the variational model for this problem. <coughs> so 
we can describe this problem by using the kahn hilliard energy, which is just, uh, just say, the usual Dirichlet energy, so the gradient of u square plus a potential part, where this W is a double well potential, which means that uh, which reaches its minimum at the pure phases. So what happens is that you have the two uh, counterparts in this energy, you know? So the, the, the potential which, when you minimize the energy, the potential will tend to make, to want the function u to go as close as possible to the two pure phases, so plus one and minus one. Whereas, of course, the gradient doesn't want to have instantaneous jumps. So this is a little bit the, the game you have between the two energies, the kinetic and the, and the potential energy. For a particular value of the, of the double well potential, the Euler-Lagrange equation is exactly the, the, of course, the allen kahn equation, and hence the connection between the, the, the phase transition model and the allen kahn equation. <coughs> As I've said, it, is, uh, it has been uh, partially slow, solved, and it has been proven uh, by more than one author for n smaller or equal than three, and it has, let's say, a, I, I keep saying that 2000 for me is still recent, but I think it's quite still recent. In 2009, uh, there is a, a proof by Ovidiu Savin for the case n between 4 and 8, but with an additional assumption. So basically, what is required is that in the direction in which the function is, in, in which the solution is required to be monotone, then you have this uh, asymptotic uh, behavior at infinity. The solution has to approach plus one and minus one going towards plus and minus infinity. There is a counterexample for n uh, equal to nine, so that is the sharp dimension of the space. So let me just at this point mention that without the additional assumption, the classical conjecture is still open. <coughs> Why eight? So let's say for n smaller or equal than three um, methods which are typical to PDEs, like for instance, the one that we're going to see uh, in my work uh, can be used. For n between four and eight, one has to use something that mm, mo surely it was known to the Georgian, that is why he formulated his conjecture in this way. And <laughs> that is the fact that there is a connection between minimal surfaces and the allen kahn equation. Roughly sp speaking, and I've showed you a little bit the picture at the, the beginning, level sets of solutions are asymptotic to global minimal graphs, so, so to global, uh, to minimal surfaces. So you have to use, let's say, you use a, a theory that is known for minimal surfaces, and from that it is quite involved, but you can uh, uh, imply, you can deduce uh, something for the allen kahn equation the conjecture of, so solving the conjecture of the George anyways. So basically these global minimal graphs are proved to be hyperplanes up to dimension eight. And that is where the dimension eight comes into play. Okay, so we move now to the, to the, fractional, uh, to the fractional conjecture, which is just simply we put the fractional Laplacian instead of the Laplace operator. And we try to <coughs> understand a little bit about what happens. Of course, the dimension is the same. Uh, the, sorry, the, um, the conjecture is the same. Uh, the dimension is, well, not yet uh, been settled. So again, a global, meaning that you have a solution in the whole space, bounded monotone solution. Is it one dimensional, at least in small dimensions? And <coughs> we have the state of the art here. I will not, well, I will not stop on the, on the names, of course, but Let's say for n, as in the classical case, for n smaller or equal than three, uh, the conjecture has been completely proved. And as you see, there is a difference between the various uh, uh, regimes of s. So the story is different for s greater or equal than one half uh, and from uh, s smaller than one half. And this is, uh, let's, let's go to the, so, and this is obvious when I just show you the last row, which is, the conjecture has been proved again by Savin, again with his additional assumption, but only for s greater or equal than one half. With, uh, let's say, exception of the, this result by Figali and Serra, where they use different methods. Uh, for, uh, for the case n between four and eight, 
again, the connection with minimal surfaces had to be used. And what type of, what type of connection and why the conjecture for S smaller than one and a half is still open? The fact, that, uh, the fact is that for S between one half and one, the connection is between the fractional allen kahn equation but local minimal surfaces, where you already have, let's say, the knowledge on how local minimal surfaces uh, uh, work. On the other hand, for S smaller than one half, the connection is between <coughs> the fractional allen kahn equation and no local minimal surfaces, which is the fractional counterpart of, of the minimal surfaces. Here, the, the, the theory is not, well, uh, is not well known, and global minimal graphs, which are actually the ones uh, that are necessary, are known to be hyperplanes only up to dimension three. And this explains, the, say, the, um, the, <coughs> uh, the state of the art of the, of the proofs up, on, up until now. Okay, uh, just one more thing. Um, when I will get to my results, so that I, I put here this, uh, this observation, <coughs> when I will get to my result, this will be uh, uh, relevant. The fact that up to dimension three, most of the proofs that have been, have been given in the no local case use local tools. So basically, the fractional Laplacian uh, allows to be, allows, uh, uh, it, it, it can be expressed as a local operator in a space with an extra dimension. Basically, there is a whole class of, opera of non-local operators that allows this, uh, this extension procedure. So basically, you, you work in the local space, you use all the, all the knowledge you have in the local space, and then you're able to deduce things in the fractional ca case also. <coughs> uh, so, I, I, sorry, I was saying, so there is a class of operators, of non-local operators that allows an extension, but not all non-local operators allow an extension. So basically, if you have to deal with an operator which uh, cannot be extended, then you cannot use the methods which have already, be, which have already been, which are already present in the literature. <coughs> so basically, that's why my results say it's, it's original in this sense. My result is related to the, to the variational uh, uh, model. So I'm going to go to um, introduce the energy related to the fractional model. So the conjecture can be stated instead of looking at solutions one, of solutions of the equation, one looks at minimizers, basically global minimizers, which are for the energy are say minimizers of the energy in a ball BR, but then you have it for all balls. And in the local case, as, as, I, as I've mentioned before, so you minimize the energy by fixing the data on the boundary of, in this case, of the ball. And the result, of course, I mean, it does not require any additional things like the solution. So the, the result is just the global minimizer of the energy is one dimensional. <coughs> what about the fractional case? The fractional case, of course, we have our uh, potential part and we have our kinetic energy with, with, uh, with which changes and which is given by the fractional Gagliardo HS semi norm and is given in this way. So first, uh, by looking a little bit of, uh, at, the, at this picture, what we have is that we minimize the energy with respect to a data which is given in the whole complementary of, in this case, of my ball. So we have a data which is fixed outside of, of the ball and you have to minimize the energy by keeping, of course, this data fixed and let's say the energy is expressed in this form, it's just the integral over R to N minus com complementary of BR square, UX minus UY to the square, and you have the kernel uh, as the one of the fractional Laplacian. So basically what you have in this double integral, you have the um, interaction between points X and Y, which are both inside BR, and one inside BR, one outside BR. So when X is inside and the other one outside. You don't need to have, of course, interaction outside, outside, because, well, the datum is fixed and you get uh, something that you, I mean, it, it is fixed and you don't have to minimize it. Um, this is 
the energy related specifically to the fractional Laplacian in the sense that if you take the first variation, then you get, for a specific W, you get the Allen Kahn equation for the fractional Laplacian. <coughs> so looking at that energy and the conjecture posed in this, way, in this, in this manner, the, the, the question that I, will, that I will try to answer in my, by presenting my main result is whether the same result holds for more general operators. And this is actually the case in the classical, uh, for the classical operators. So for instance, it has been proven for the P Laplacian uh, that holds in the same manner as for P equal to. So they are one dimensional up to dimension eight. <coughs> this is what I was able to come up with. So this is the form of the, of the, of the main result, which is that global minimizers, which we need to ask that they are continuous since we don't have a regularity theory in, let's say, for this general energy, over no local energy are one dimensional. And there is, so there is a generalization in the sense of the no locality. So what type of no local operators I'm able to prove the, 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 the theory, the result with. But there is no generalization in the, in the case n equal to. So I have told you all about the big picture, what happens up to dimension eight, but we're only going to focus to in, in dimension two, and I'm going also to make clear why uh, this cannot go upper to, an, uh, let's say, to a higher dimension, which would be uh, three. Um, the no local energy, on the other hand, generalizes the case of the fractional Laplacian to, more general, to more ge much more general operators such as the fractional P-Laplacian or the fractional mean curvature operator. I'm going to give just very briefly the, the definition, but just to show you that they are quite different in their substance. And just as the last, uh, the last thing that up to my knowledge, there is only one uh, D result, so one dimensionality result for more general operators that include the case of the fractional P-Laplacian. And it has been given with other methods uh, in particular using Liouville type theorem by Fasge and Sire, more or less the same time as my result came out. Okay. <coughs> so this is basically the result. Sorry. So now we are going to consider a function u, which is defined in the, on R2 takes values in minus one, one, is a global continuous minimizer of the energy. The energy is very general in the sense that it's given as the double integral uh, S for the, let's say the double integral, uh, the no local double integral of a general <coughs> function F, which has two variables. The first variable is the difference between UX and UY, and of course it's a, it's a value in R. The second is the, let's say, the distance between the points X and Y. And, uh, and W, I mean, it is, not, it, it is enough to take it C1 with uh, vanishing himself and its derivative in plus and minus one. So the question now that we have to answer in the next, uh, in the next pages is what, <coughs> what type of um, conditions I have to put on F in order to make the result work. And I'm, I'm not going to go into, into, into the technical part. I will just say, as I've mentioned before, that the, energy, that the, the, the result works for the fractional pi Laplace operator, and this is how the energy uh, is given for the case of the, let's say, the first vari variation of, if you put F inside, you take the first variation, you would obtain the equation with the fractional pi Laplace. Of course, for p equal two, we end up with, with the one of, for the fractional Laplacian that we've seen before. <coughs> the result also applies to the fractional mean curvature uh, operator, which is, I'm not, so I, I don't want to go into detail on this formula. Just, I, I just want to, to underline the fact that the, they are, let's say, the the result is general enough to include these two quite different cases, as you can see from, at least from their definition. <coughs> so now I will go to, into uh, what is necessary to assume on F. 
I'm going just to say it in words a little bit and also giving you uh, just a bit of how we, uh, we did the, the proof. <coughs> so taking such a non-local, uh, such a general uh, operator, what we have to do, we, we had to start a little bit from zero, so we didn't have anything. So the first thing was actually to prove existence of minimizers. And we did that by, by direct methods. So, the, the, of course, here the important thing were, were to identify the, the fractional space in which we work, the right conditions on the exterior data. Anyways, we, we, you can do that by using the basic tools, so you actually, what you have to require is lower semi-continuity, semi-continuity in the first variable, uh, well, symmetry, okay, and integrability assumptions, which uh, make sure that you have compactness in the right spaces. So this is just approved by direct methods with the right uh, conditions. Uh, <coughs> A second thing that we have to prove, and this is actually uh, as far as I know, still an open problem also for the fraction uh, P Laplacian for minimizers. What we, ha we, we needed some sort of comparison principle. Uh, we were able to obtain a very weak version of this comparison principle, which ba basically says that if you have two minimizers which are ordered in the whole space, but they overlap in, uh, not in a point, unfortunately, but they have to overlap, let's say, in a small ball, then this cannot happen. So they have to be, they equal everywhere. So let's say two order minimizers cannot touch in a small ball. If they touch, they have to coincide everywhere. And we do that by uh, taking the, let's say, the first variation of the, of, the, of the energy. So we need to require some differentiability in the first variable. And in order to have the weak uh, equation well-defined, we need to ask for suitable upper bounds. And in order to obtain then comparison principle, one needs the convexity <coughs> of, the, of the energy, in, again, in the first variable. <coughs> and these are all, let's say, these are results that hold in the whole space Rn uh, and are preliminary, uh, prelim let's say, preliminary uh, uh, results that we need in order to obtain the main theorem, which is basically based on two um, very important energy estimates. So <laughs> these energy estimates, which I'm going to, uh, which I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, require some other conditions, which are monotonicity in the first and second variable. Uh, and then the result is proved. I will not go into, de go into detail on this, but it, it's basically one has to take a, a suitable non-local competitor, take a Taylor expansion in the second variable, and for that, what we need is to be, to be able to take uh, the derivative of our function f two times in the, second derivative, in, the, in the second variable, and that is why we have to require some smoothness and suitable upper bounds in order to have everything well defined. <coughs> What are the energy estimates that we use? And this is, this I will use to make clear why we are able to prove the, the result only for n equal to two. So, and also to give you a little bit uh, um, more technical things of, on how we, we were able to prove the result. One energy estimate says that if you have a global minim bounded global minimizer, then the energy of such a minimizer in a ball does not grow more than R, which is, so say the energy of this minimizer in a ball does, no grow, does not grow more than the radius of the ball to the power n. You can see it written more clear, very much, m much more clear here. The second, uh, uh, the second estimates on the other hand is, <coughs> let's say, allows to compare the energy of uh, perturbation of a function u. So u, for, for now, is not a minimizer. You take a function u, you perturb it in a sense that, let's say, if you think that this be equal to 1, that what you actually have is a translation, but actually have a translation with respect to a compactly supported perturbation, 
Notice that, what this, and this is important, that uh, as outside of the ball BR, the two functions are, are equal because, well, the function is compactly supported in B1. And if you have, if you build a competitor, any competitor, so for any function phi, uh, var, var phi, phi, if you build it like this, then you have this energy estimates. So if you sum the energy, so let's say, I'm going to call it translation even though it's not. If you take the translation, the positive and the, so in one direction and the other, and you sum the energies, and then you take out the energy of U, then you still are able to uh, have an upper bound, which depends on the energy of U over R to the power 2. This is um, a little bit, I, I was saying, you take a Taylor expansion of order 2, this is the best you can do. You cannot go further with, the, with this type of, of, uh, of competitor that you use. And that's why, basically, you obtain only r to the power 2. And that is basically why, in the end, we are not able to go over this power. So I have this that holds for minimizers. This has, that holds for any u, but if u is a minimizer, then this is uh, it's greater than 0. So you still have uh, this only for the, let's say, the positive translation. And the proof is then based on the fact that we prove that this, uh, that this difference is, uh, well, we prove that this difference is strictly bounded from below, and we are able, able to obtain a contradiction, because that's the method we use, uh, only in the case, R, R, uh, sorry, only in, the, in dimension two. So let me be a little more precise on this. And so what we do is that we prove, basically we prove that U is monotone in any direction, and this will imply that U is one dimensional. By contradiction, we suppose that th this does not happen. So for instance, U is not monotone in the E1 direction. We build <coughs> a competitor as in the energy estimates I've, sh I've, shown, I've shown you along this direction. And basically then we, are, we, we need to do two things. Find an opportune delta R, which is smaller and equal than this one. So remember that U is, in a, U is a minimizer, so this is always positive. But the main thing is that we have to prove that this actually, we have to define this delta R in a suitable way that we are able to bound it uniformly uh, with respect to R from below. And this, as I've said before, for n equal 2, allows to obtain a contradiction in this way. So <coughs> I would like to ask for the, for the people in the audience, or because there is a little, so there are a little bit more of explanations on uh, why, so a little bit on how the proof works. I would, uh, I, maybe I should leave it out, or I mean. I think you still have time, so. Okay. Okay, so I will take maybe a little bit of more time. So I've said before that there are two things that we have to do. And we have to suitably define this delta R, so find some delta R. Uh, well, we're going to define it in a, su in a suitable way that, that, that then will allow us to have this uniform bound from below, which is the, the, main, th the main thing of the, of the of the result. <coughs> so we go by contradiction. We suppose that U is not monotone. Then we are able to say this, that let's say, we, by contradiction we say that uh, U at the point zero is uh, larger both than U uh, evaluated in U1 and U evaluated minus U1. So this is for sure uh, a good thing. We consider a perturbation as, I've, as in, the, in the energy estimates that I've shown you in this, uh, in this way. So of course it will be a competitor for you because they will have the same data outside of the ball BR. It will be, let's say, some perturbation from BR, uh, from BR half to BR and it will be exactly the translation of you 
in the smaller, in the half ball BR2. Notice that, well, if you put E1 here, then you have UR plus is equal, in E1 is equal to U0, and this is strictly greater than uh, U of E1. And this is important, why? Because now I'm going to take the minimum between UR plus and U. We are dealing with <laughs> continuous minimizers. So we are able to say this. VR cannot be both, of course, U or UR plus, because it's strictly, uh, at least in one point, is strictly smaller than one of them. Of course, it is a competitor because it's equal okay, okay, to both of them outside of VR. But the thing, important thing from the continuity we have that uh, this minimizer has to be equal to, say, to U in a neighborhood of E1 because, well, e, sorry, because U in E1 is the smallest. Uh, of course, these two, these two functions are ordered. Now we use the comparison principle, which says that VR cannot be minimal, say, in a smaller ball, so we take R large enough, say, in, this ball, in, in, the, in the ball B2. VR cannot be minimal because they are ordered, they touch in, a neighbor of, in the neighborhood of E1, U is a global minimizer, so it's a minimizer also in B2, so VR cannot be also minimal in B2. We use the existing theorem, so we are able to say that, well, if VR is not a good minimizer, that v, then there has to exist a minimizer which has the VR data outside of, the complement, uh, outside of B2, and we call this VR star. And this is exactly how we define this delta R, which is the difference between the energies of these two functions. And this is, of course, <coughs> since VR star is a minimizer, this is greater or equal than zero. <coughs> in order to uh, prove also the, the second part, we do, uh, well, first we use convexity uh, in this way. It is well known also, well, in the classical case anyways, if you have the minimum, if you consider the minimum between two functions and the maximum between two functions, due to the convexity, if you add up the energy of the minimum plus maximum, you stay below the energy of the two original functions. Now, if U is <laughs> a minimizer, then you're able to say that the energy of our function VR stays below the energy of our perturbation in the positive direction. And then we have this chain of inequalities that we use in this way. So, U is a minimizer. Then in the ball VR, it will anyway stay below the energy of VR star. But the VR star is, the energy of VR star, we define delta R to be exactly the difference between the two. So this is exactly this. But now this is smaller than this one. So basically we have uh, obtained that delta R is smaller than the energy of UR plus minus the energy of U, which is the first thing <laughs> we need. In order to obtain the, the, the second part, we uh, reason more or less in the same way with an important difference. So we now we take just the perturbation of U, uh, sorry, the, the translation of U in the E1 direction. Again, we consider the minimum, uh, which we call M, the minimum between U and this uh, translation. We notice, or we try to remember that they coincide in the ball BR2 because VR also was, uh, was just a translation in the half ball. <coughs> As before, we, we use the same things. We say that M cannot be minimal from the comparison principle. Then there has to be a minimal or at least a, a better competitor. And then we, are, we just write uh, let Z be that competitor, we just write the difference between the energy of M and the energy of this competitor, but this time in the, in the ball B2. So now we have obtained, which is actually uh, our uh, constant C, which does not depend on R anymore in any way, so it's uh, uniform with respect to R. And now we just use <coughs> a chain of inequalities, um, basically uh, another, uh, let's say this is important, that they coincide in the ball in order to be able to bound from below uh, the difference between this energy by just r to the power minus sp, and this is uh, quite simple, uh, using, let's say, the, the, not, the, um, the, just the, the, the upper bounds for the, 
for the energy anyways so it's it's not let's say this is a very important part in this but it's quite easy to obtain and now you just have to send r to infinity and you get exactly what we needed the fact that delta r is a, is a bounded from below from a, by a, a uniform constant and in this way you can obtain the contradiction and conclude the proof okay <laughs> thank you for your attention <laughs>